So, ladies and gentlemen, the, the theme of this uh, conference is globalization. <coughs> and it is therefore quite logical that our first panel will discuss some issues that are closely linked to this topic of globalization. And I'm very pleased and honored to have sitting next to me Inga Biel, who is the CEO of uh, Lloyds of London, uh, Horry de Castre, who is the CEO of AXA France, and Felix Hufeld, whom I now have to present in different ways, Felix, uh, because you are not only the chairman of the executive committee of the IAIS, but you have also recently been nominated as the chairman of Baffin, and congratulations for that. Inga, if I may start with you. If you talk about globalization, we would believe that listening also to the words of, of Dirk Kempthorne and his visit to India, that the world is now getting more and more free and that the insurance industry, and particularly the reinsurance industry, can travel around the globe not finding any hindrance. Is that the truth? <laughs> well, yes, and we've also heard a little bit this morning about how um, open, being an open market is so important here in Luxembourg. Um, and, of course, there's no doubt that open markets for insurance and reinsurance are really valuable to countries, societies, businesses all around the world. Um, they obviously diversify risk globally, and we've heard uh, again about this this morning already. Um, they promote growth and they support growing economies. Insurance, and particularly if it's open market insurance around the world, it helps build resilience, uh, particularly into high growth in some of the emerging economies. And we've also seen, uh, with actual experience, how much a country benefits if they've suffered a disaster, some natural catastrophe, how they benefit from capital pouring in um, to, you know, in their recovery process. However, when we look around the world, uh, we don't see that uh, the benefit of this is so fully understood. And I've got two examples, just going back a few years. Um, we can see two completely different examples here, but both uh, in 2010 and both earthquake examples. One in New Zealand, which suffered um, a very nasty earthquake, costing $6.5 billion dollars. And yet 80% of that was insured. And you could quickly see, while they were having all sorts of difficulty deciding about how to rebuild the city, um, but how quickly capital poured into the country in, and helped the, the country recover. Then you go to a completely other part of the world, and you go to Haiti, and they had uh, a loss uh, from their earthquake of about $9 billion. Now, 99% of that was uninsured. The bill cost them over 150% of an annual GDP, and they're still working out how to recover from it. So I think one example on the plus side of how capital coming in from outside and having open market can benefit a country when it's rebuilding itself. So, but what we're seeing, and particularly in some of the emerging economies where you've got a growing middle class, you've got businesses growing, you've got people buying insurance for the first time, we're seeing actually an increasing sense of protectionism rather than opening up the markets and using global capital flows. We're seeing governments perhaps inhibiting the way foreign um, operations can be set up in these countries. There are restrictions about ownership, although we are seeing, as you mentioned, India, some ownership restrictions opening up. But basically, there are certain restrictions coming into play in, in some of these particularly, as I said, high growth economies where they're actually discriminating against um, foreign ownership and they're insisting a lot on localization of assets rather than opening up to um, global capital. And, and while such controls, I believe, are meant to be underpinning and supporting the development of the domestic insurance capability, um, in fact, they're sort of undermining that development. I think these trade restrictions, they're limiting um, the local insurers in their financial capacity. They can't, they're not just being allowed to go out and grab the capital that's available around the world, and we know there's a lot of it wanting actually to invest in insurance right now. 
They have less capabilities because if they're a growing market, they don't have the expertise, so they're not being able to tap in to expertise from some of those mature markets. And the risk, obviously, is being very concentrated, um, which isn't good news if they're then suffering from some sort of catastrophe. And I believe that the, um, you know, the financial crisis did spark a lot of this increased protectionism. And it wasn't necessarily done actually to be protectionist. It was really because there were some failings in some of the existing systems of financial regulation. So they felt they needed to tighten them up. But perhaps they've now, now lost sight that they're actually now restricting and they're becoming much more of a closed market and they're, and they're, they're um, um, limiting the, this global capital flow. Um, I was um, out in Singapore uh, fairly recently with a lot of other people from the insurance industry as the Geneva Association met there. And I was there very much sort of banging the drum for Lloyd's. And I feel I, I need to do that a lot around the world. I get the opportunity to speak at a lot of events and I always talk about trying to open up markets and have free trade around the world. And Singapore, I think, is a, is a wonderful case study uh, very much like Luxembourg, it relies on cross-border trade. And since the Monetary Authority of Singapore opened up um, the insurance market there in 2000, they've quadrupled um, the insurance uh, premium there. They had, there was 8% growth last year. And what they did and what Lloyd's was then able to do, so a sort of private um, insurance sector player coming in, we were able to bring a respected brand to a market that was starting up. We were able to bring underwriting expertise, particularly for very specialist risks. And we were able, importantly, to bring um, a network of sort of trusted relationships, because our business is very, very much about trust. And I think that's a great case in point where um, uh, a monetary authority has said, right, we're going to open up our borders, we're going to rely on cross-border trade, and then work with private sector. And we were very proud that we were able to work together, and therefore Lloyds and Singapore were able to prosper together. Well, thank you very much, Inga. That is that's very interesting. But the question then, of course, is when things are not going the right direction, what can Europe do about it? Is there something Europe can do about it in order to open the trade, to open the doors for broader investment abroad or for reinsurance trade? Yeah. Well, I think, um, again, I think someone touched on it earlier about that we, you know, we've got this, this you know, free trade going on within Europe. And I think people can see, therefore, how individual countries can actually benefit from that. So I think there's a lot to be, to, you know, for the EU to show we are an example. We're an example of how it can work. And certainly negotiating, whether it's um, with a, I mean, we were talking um, in the insurance sector about an EU-US covered agreement. What can we do to make sure that, um, you know, we can trade more freely? We should talk a lot through all of our lobbying efforts and talk to other associations, regulators around the world. I think it's great that you're, you're getting regulators and various um, uh, representatives from associations from around the world to join in here. And I think they can hear about the good stuff that's actually happening and has happened um, um, with good results here in Europe. Could you imagine an agreement between the EU and the US when the US keeps reinsurance collateral? Well, obviously, that's on the, that's on the list. Um, and of course, it's not only the US that we're seeing this. So while we would love to, to see something happen on that, and we're a very keen supporter of it, we shouldn't just focus on the US, because what we're seeing is an increased protectionism and people looking at what other countries are doing. So we see more countries perhaps putting up collateral requirements, closing down their, their borders, and saying you've got to have assets and everything um, um, ring-fenced and put into the country. In fact, we've even seen it um, to a certain extent um, in the UK, uh, with the PRA saying, well, actually, we prefer some of these non-EU companies to have subsidiaries yes. in the UK yeah. rather than branches. Now, for the policyholder, is that beneficial if they've then got a restricted capital pool that they can um, rely on uh, rather than the full capital uh, base of the, the parent company? So I know we've, we're seeing some actions like that even in the UK. Yeah, you see, nobody's without sins. That's the world. <laughs> Harry, if I may move maybe to... Uh, the international capital standard debate. And uh, of course, you are privileged of being a, a global uh, CFI, uh, which today many people envy you, apparently, that uh, you are a global CFI. Uh, you must, as the CEO of AXA, you must be troubled every day with solvency to on the one hand, then the international capital standard. We heard this three already, a basic capital requirement, and then the HLA and the ICS. 
how can you manage to bring all these things together? <laughs> That's a good question, I Carol. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I would say, being a GC fee, so it's a sort of club where um, people badmouth you, but there is a point where they try to be part of the club, because if they are not, it's not elegant. Uh, <laughs> having said that, first, uh, our international business has never expanded so fast. So yes, it's true, uh, there are some protectionist temptations in some countries, but what you have to say in counterpart to that is the fact that never have business opportunities been so large because there are a large number of people every year emerging out of poverty and therefore say, the people who want to I mean, have protection and go for insurance solutions are growing by millions every year. Uh, point one, point two, I mean, for very large international groups and not only us, I mean, we have a number of friends of competitors who are doing the same, provided you pick the right partner, I think it's possible to develop your business. So yes, there is a point about the concern on protectionism, but I don't think we should overplay it. I think very large players can play with it. On international regulation, it's more complex. And since I've passed the age where you need to be polite, um, the key question is what are we looking for together? Are we looking for form or are we looking for substance? Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, in nobody's interest to have an unstable, unpredictable system. So every uh, player in this room will probably agree to the point that what we are looking for is stability, predictability, reliability, transparency. Then you have to ask yourself the question, are the means we are using to achieve this goal uh, or these goals, uh, the right ones? Uh, and there I start to be skeptical. Uh, because I think we are living in a world where, on one hand, uh, we are overflown by liquidity, but on the other hand, I mean, the other side of the coin is that never has the allocation of long-term savings be so poor. Mm -hmm. There is a massive misallocation of long-term savings, partly driven by the outcome of the regulations which have been put in place over the last, I would say, 20 or 25 years. This is the world we are living into. Uh, we can adjust to that. Large players are adjusting. I think the players like uh, AXA, Allianz, Zurich, Generali will resist approximately any, uh, any event. But the question is, what is the price they, their shareholders, their policyholders, and the collectivity has to pay for that? The regulation is not always consistent, not always clear, uh, doesn't operate under uh, time frames or frameworks which are uh, clear enough. And I'll give you um, a couple of examples on that, and, and it's something we have debated with, uh, with Felix more than once, and, and, and we know that both sides are doing efforts to try to converge. But if I look at the uh, definition of systemic institutions, fine, I mean, nice to be part of the club, uh, but what is uh, non-traditional, non-insurance activity. If anybody in the room has a clear definition, I'm ready to pay him or her a lunch. Uh, and a good lunch. I mean, in a good restaurant in Luxembourg. Because it's obscure. Not very clear. Point one. Point two, uh, everybody agrees on the fact that there should be a significant difference between the banking and the insurance regulation. Well, when you go to the practical details, you have the feeling that there is more of an approach where some, I mean, people here and there are trying to find a sort of one, one size fits all approach, ignoring the very essence of the insurance business model. When you move to uh, BCR, HLA, and so on and so forth, are you looking for form or are you looking for substance? We have now in Europe a regulation which has its, uh, fl its flows with Solvency II, but at least is the outcome of approximately 15 years of work is more or less consistent. Is it compatible with the BCR HLA approach? Not proven. And so all the uh, groups which have built at great expense with great research, pretty sophisticated internal models, are now faced to the risk to have to steer their activities using two different frameworks. What's assuring us 
that the BCA HLA approach is going to be consistent with solvency two, very frankly said, at this stage, nothing. Is the consistency of HLA a real one? No, because it's not applied on consistent BCAs. It's nice to say that it has to bite, fine, but uh, uh, if it's inconsistent, if it doesn't produce the same effects in the same situations, if it doesn't produce the same effect in all the geographies, it's not a consistent framework. So we should not fool ourselves. This is not to say that we are refusing a global approach. What we are saying is just step back, wait a minute. If you want to have a real approach, let it be consistent and take the necessary time to, to go with it. And we understand that these things are not simple. I mean, when I see what the ambition is on ICS, well, maybe it's because I have now more than a quarter of a century of experience in this sector, but I have my doubts. Uh, and these doubts are supported by the fact that when I look at the time it has taken for Europe to come out with Solvency II, when I look at the fact that these days, I mean, we are on the 28th of May, we are supposed to have an answer on the equivalence regime before the end of the month from the European Commission. We still do not have it. So this allows me to live in hope because I think we are all pursuing the same goals. Yes, we want a stable system. Yes, we want a transparent system. Yes, we want consistency. Yes, we think we can contribute to long-term investments. So I live in hope, uh, but the level of my faith has to be very high to make me optimistic that the current Bibles which are written are going to uh, say increase my uh, level of faith. I, I'm, still, uh, I'm still interested in your lunch uh, proposal. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, non-traditional, non-insurance, don't we all agree? We can't define it, but we know it when we see it. Is that right? Maybe. So I have a luncheon. Where are we going? No, well, it's not, it's, <laughs> it's not a precise definition because translate that, translate that into an internal model and then you have the lunch with a dessert. No, I, I think that's worth a and dinner. And a good wine. That's worth a dinner. <laughs> No, but to, to, to come back to your point, um, supervisors, regulators around the world would say, okay, all this debate about the national capital standard, but it's in the interest of the industry, because how can you as AXA compare yourself with an American, a Japanese insurer, unless you have a kind of a, a standard of, of, of comparison? W would you consider that as, a, as, a, as an important argument? No, but, I mean, Karel, I mean, I, I'm, none of us is refusing any standard, but we were born in this industry listening to the previous generation which was teaching us that we would see the convergence between IFRS and US GAAP. Uh, I still believe in miracles because I'm a devout Catholic. You hope, but you hope. Uh, I think this is a miracle I won't see, certainly before my retirement and probably uh, before my ultimate day. Well, so allow me to be skeptical on that. Yes, yes. Well, you see, Felix, in the end, I remember from my old days, it always ends up on your desk. I mean, you're the bad guy. Clearly, I mean, you're working on an issue that is troubling the rest of the world. You're not doing it right. You're doing it too quickly. Um, and basically, people are saying, the reason why you're doing that in the IES is because these guys in the FSB, they don't know what insurance is. Is that true? Well, um... <laughs> <No. laughs> The short answer is no. Um, uh, let, let, let me start in saying uh, the mandate given to the FSB is not the same mandate as it given to the sectoral global standard setters. Let it be the Basel Committee, let it be IAS or IOSCO. FSB's mandate is focused on preserving financial stability, which by definition is just a subset of issues mm -hmm. slash corporates to look at. IAS, looking at the insurance industry, um, is looking at a much broader scope of companies and issues, and that's the right thing to do. So there's a huge overlap, obviously, which, which does 
uh, justify the interaction, the ongoing interaction um, with the FSB. But of course, your question has been pointing out to something else, which, which is a very legitimate concern. Historically speaking, the FSB being a rather young venture, in a way, is indeed be dominated by pretty much a central banking community, which is another way of saying an enormously smart and well-trained crowd of people to cope with complex systems. Do they know a lot about insurance? No. I think Governor Kempthorne's comments he made from the US is, is right on target, and you could copy-paste that experience um, uh, to any other part of the world. Um, I'm not trying to make condescending remarks about central bankers. On the contrary, as uh, Governor Kempton pointed out, they are hugely interested. And they are getting more and more interested in figuring out what's going on there in that, in that insurance industry. Um, and that's why I think um, the regulator, particularly if it's an insurance regulator, is not just the bad guy. It's your ally and your industry's allies in educating a broader world on what the insurance business model is all about. Let's not forget that. So just a little bit of an example as maybe a little piece of helpful feedback to what I've been hearing um, throughout the morning. If you rightly so point to the fact that you are part of the solution and not part of the problem, I couldn't agree more. That is most definitely the right thing to say. However, think about that. If you're sitting in the seat of a financial stability regulator, whoever you are, a central banking governor or, or, or whatever, um, and you keep hearing that again and again and again and again, combined with, I'll come back to that in a moment, Ori, um, many of the good remarks he made about what's going on currently, the real message they are hearing is the whole insurance industry telling them don't call me, we call you. Leave us alone. We have nothing to do with the kind of problems you are dealing with. And I can only tell you this is a fundamentally dangerous, maybe unintended, hidden message you're sending out there. You have to be part of the game. Yeah. You have to be into it. If you're telling the outside world, don't touch us, we are the good guys, we are coping with the solutions and not the problems, they read your message in, you know, we want to have a free lunch. And that's simply not going to happen. Believe it or not, this industry has lost its innocence at the latest with AIG. And there's absolutely no way to fall back behind that. And of course, it's, it's, it's absolutely right that it's not been the insurance piece of AIG who caused the problem. But it's been the group AIG's management who allowed the leverage, leveraging of a stable insurance balance sheet to the benefit of a highly risky derivatives trading platform in London who created the problem. So here we go. So how many of the large insurance groups out there in the world are really pure, pure play insurance companies? There are many companies around to start with who have a conglomerate structure, including banking business, a vast asset management operation and what have you. There's no such thing than sort of an innocent pure play insurance piece, particularly not on a large scale international uh, 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 scope. It just doesn't exist. So one way or the other, um, I think it's no point in being too black and white about that issue and I can only encourage you to reframe your observation about we are part of the solution in a way that it's not misread by the broader international regulatory community. Now, NTNI and I, Henri, well, of course you are right. It's not a precise definition yet. It's so difficult. you agree with me I shouldn't pay dinner we'll have, yet? Maybe no, we'll have the yeah. lunch together. You yeah, know. Precise, yeah, <laughs> precisely, precisely. You want to join us? Uh, but, but on the other hand, you know, um, many of the speakers who took the stage this morning, rightly so, rightly so, pointed to the fact that IAS, and I personally endorse that statement 100%, 100%, that traditional insurance business, whatever that is, is usually not the cause of the problem. 
So in your very best interest, you shouldn't throw away the notion of anti-ENI because it's, it's your escape door to sort of a prudent regulation talking about systemic risk. So there may be a lot of unclarities around sort of the edges, the borders of anti-ENI, but the very concept of safeguarding that core insurance traditional business is very unlikely to be systemic. And if you move on into sort of anti ni type of business, whatever that may mean in detail, is your conceptual ticket to safeguard 80% of your business or more. So let's not forget about that. So you'd be very unsmart to sort of throw away that anti ni approach yeah. to regulating systemic risk. I, I think it's a very important point, uh, Felix, and I, I'd like to, to hear a little bit from, from the three of you whether you share that view that the insurance industry is maybe today not insuring enough and has become more like a financial institution. I think it must be a problem for you, Inga, because you are, you are reinsuring. I mean, it is no insurance, there's no reinsurance. Is that logical? Yeah, well, actually Lloyd's is 65% insurance, 35% reinsurance. Okay. People often think of us as just a reinsurer, but actually predominantly we're an insurer. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, we, we also, as a, as a market, actually have set our stall out to be very much the traditional risk transfer mechanism. And um, because of the unique nature of Lloyd's, we don't really, we, we don't have banking arm or an asset management arm or anything. So we are a little bit more of a pure insurer and reinsurer. Um, and I think for us, we're actually looking at how we can make sure that because risk transfer is what we're about, and you've got people, you've got capital coming in wanting to be perhaps a bit more creative about risk and taking risk off of people, that, um, that mustn't be too far removed because the, it, you know, you, you, we're skilled at taking on risk. And what we're keen to do is to make sure that there's something it, managing that risk, assessing the exposures before it just goes off to innocent capital. That's the piece that concerns us most about what we're seeing with um, new capital coming in rather than actually um, within the Lloyds market as such anything you know, that, that, that our companies are doing. Yeah. Harry, um, you, you mentioned also this idea about opportunities. A lot of opportunities you said uh, because there's more and more people that could eventually buy insurance. Do you feel that the insurance industry is enough doing of that real insurance, taking away the risk from private individuals? Yeah, I think there are two, um, two things. First, I mean, never did we have that many opportunities to reinvent the business model. Uh, and I think this is going to be the big game for the industry going forward. Because the combination of the impact of new technologies and emerging markets is creating very, very powerful combinations. And we, as an example, are looking very, very closely at the sort of business models who are emerging in Africa. I think the way the banking sector is looking at it, because it's probably going to make insurance affordable to populations who didn't have access to it before, just by the sheer use of, I mean, absolutely new technologies in terms of access to the customers or access to data. So this is interesting and would go into the direction no, in reality, we are doing more and more. Uh, what we do with traditional business models is, I mean, as I said before, I think under-optimized. It's not that we do not uh, uh, take risks or transfer risks. It's that the, uh, um, I mean, some elements of the regulatory framework have led to a sort of deformation of the profile of what we can do uh, because the short-sightedness of the regulation is forcing us to, I would say, ignore what would be the normal long-term duration of the liabilities in the way we allocate the assets. We are transforming the product mix, we are transforming the asset allocation, and we are not optimizing what we could do. We are still doing it, but we may be doing less of it, or doing it in a way which is economically less efficient than what it could have been. That's okay. clear. Yeah. I, just wanted, so I just wanted to add about the opportunity. So we know from a recent survey of risk managers of businesses, because mm -hmm. Lloyd's again specializes in the commercial uh, space, um, that we're, insurance is providing 
uh, protection for only or less than 10% of the risks that the businesses face. So that, to me, indicates that there's lots of opportunity out there for specialist insurance, and, and, um, and, and we want to try and grab that. So we've got to remain very innovative. And people often are, are, are saying, well, is regulation too onerous to limit your innovation? And of course, um, that's why we're also very keen on what you can do with your own internal models to assess your risk, because we feel we're the experts as assessing that risk. And as we take on new products, we want to be able to show that we're actually putting the appropriate capital against those. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to mention about um, sort of opportunity for uh, growth is that we see increasing governments, of course, being some of our major competitors. And if you look at the US market and you look at the catastrophes, and it's a big country, very catastrophe prone, as we sure. know, and you look at um, the you know, disaster, say Hurricane Betsy back in the 60s, and you'll see that I think it was 80 or 90% of that, that loss was paid by the insurance industry. You go over each decade in the US, culminating with 2012 and Superstorm Sandy, um, where that is completely reversed, and that was funded about 80% by the government in the US. And you can see that continuing trend, even in a developed market like the US. So we've got, I think, more that we can do, but we've just got to go after that opportunity. Yeah. It's very interesting you say that, and, and I want to hear also Felix's view about this. I, I have the feeling, when I, when I keep listening to these debates, that the communication doesn't run very well between the two sides. I mean, on the one hand, uh, the regulators look at the insurers as maybe as a problem because they're not doing what they expect them to be doing. On the other side, the insurance industry is looking at the regulators as the problem because they don't perceive everything you can actually be doing. Can something be done? Do you think, Felix, that that communication is working well, that dialogue between the two sides, between regulators and the industry? I think that the dialogue is running extremely well. And, and, and we shouldn't feel bad about it. Um, you can always improve anything, but, but there's no major, major lack of communication whatsoever. Uh, the main task, as, as um, mentioned before, is indeed to educate non-insurance people on the nature of the insurance business model. Amongst the regulatory community, let it be regional in Europe, let it be uh, global, and the industry as, is as close as it gets. And, and it, that's exactly the way it should be. There's absolutely no way you can produce uh, a, a decent regulation without being in close touch with the industry. Um, now, however, let me just pick up w w one point because there have been several remarks ma made about that. Um, and sometimes we're mixing up global regulation with sovereignty too in our, our European case. Um, uh, certain trends, shifts in products, um, lack of security for millions of customers, which are currently or predominantly blamed on, on increased regulation, is in fact shooting the messenger as opposed to the real underlying cause. It's much more driven by the deterioration of the inter interest rate environment, yeah. as we all know, um, which is pretty much sacking whole classes of products, um, and which are being made or rendered unsustainable and revised regulation is just making it obvious as of today. Um, so would that be any different without sovereignty too? No, it would not. So let's not shoot the messenger. Let's just try to calibrate um, well-made regulation with what's going on in the outside world. On the other hand, I completely agree with Henri's point. It is an ongoing challenge looking at sovereignty too and possibly beyond. I mean, it never stops which is not a threat, uh, maybe a hope. Um, um, that um, to reconcile the long-term nature of, of insurance business, let it be on the investment side, let it be on the liability side, needs to be properly reflected in an appropriate prudential regime. Um, and indeed, um, as we all know, we have spent an enormous amount of time, and, 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 and uh, Boca to should be here <laughs> and back in a moment, I um, know that very well. Um, we have spent an enormous amount of time in Europe to um, get our head around a too high level of pro-cyclicality built into sovereignty two uh, on the one hand and the nature of long-term business on the other hand. And we've thrown in all sorts of mitigants um, into the system. The price being paid for that is an enormous level of complexity. Um, 
So if I had a wish going forward, 2003, so don't shoot me for mentioning 2003, <laughs> um, um, but you know, someday we'll have to think about that. Those would be my personal two wishes, to, to tackle um, a too high level of prosecular cali, which is just no, another way of saying what you said, uh, short-termism versus long-termism, and, and over-complexity. If, if you have a too small subset of ultra-smart people amongst a group of very smart people who, who can only deal with solvency too, you're in trouble. Um, so we should change that. Well, I, I, I shall not venture in that territory because I could tell a lot of stories about that. But let's maybe have a look at the audience, whether there's any uh, question from the, the floor that you want to, to raise. I see one hand going up. If, can somebody bring a microphone over there? If you could please uh, tell us your name and where you come from, uh, who you are, basically. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Catherine Chi. I'm a journalist with SNL Financial in London. Uh, just following on from the discussion on the open market, I wondered if the panel could comment on the prospect of a UK exit from the EU. <laughs> well, maybe we can look at it from a risk management perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, are you considering, I, I do remember in, on the Scottish referendum, the, the insurance industry, the financial industry in the UK was having developing scenarios. Uh, is that something that, that Lloyds is doing too? Yeah, well, actually, Lloyds has already issued a paper on it. Ooh. And that was before, no, this was before the, um, the latest election result. Um, but yes, we have it. It's available on Lloyds.com and you can read our views, <laughs> although they're obviously not out there for everyone because it was quoted... Um, I think uh, in the journalist, uh, by a journalist on Sunday that they would love to hear Lloyds of London's view um, on um, whether you know, it would be bad for business. We, we believe it would be bad for business. Uh, as I said, we have gone out publicly and stated that. Um, we think this open trade, this being part of a bigger community is, is very important. And having just been out to Asia and seen the growth there, and how uh, strong and powerful some of these economies like China and India are going to be in the future, um, I would wholeheartedly welcome a stronger Europe rather than um, uh, you know, all of these countries getting smaller and smaller and um, smaller and smaller, less important in the world on their own. Yeah. Uh, Harry or Felix, would you, would you like to comment? Or, uh... Go ahead, Felix. Well, 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 to be honest, to be sitting at between the British and the French uh, is an enormously comfortable position uh, from, from where I'm sitting. <laughs> and I would hate to see that being changed, uh, frankly. Now, uh, joking aside, uh, I think it would be disastrous, um, including for the British people themselves. Um, uh, we do need the UK within the EU for all, all many reasons. And from an insurance point of view in particular, it, uh, London is most definitely one of the leading, the if markets. not the leading, hub for insurance business, and business means people, know-how, expertise, uh, global networks, and everything, and it will be absolutely disastrous to, to lose that from an EU point of view, so let's please try everything we can jointly to, to avoid that happening. Harry, you want to comment, or you don't have to? No, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I share absolutely what has been said, but uh, I mean, then the question is, uh, um, I mean, how do you manage the solution and I think we should use the British request for reform or clarification to try to come out with a better governance at European level because it's clear, I mean, we all know in this room that there are things which can be improved and what I hope is that the, the joint efforts of the German and the French government in the discussions with, uh, with the British government will help gain a clarification on what is the appropriate future governance for Europe. Should we have two circles, one of them integrating faster within the uh, monetary union, and a second one which would uh, be still part of Europe, but uh, uh, with a lesser degree of integration, it's a possibility. I mean, we all know, I mean, what, what strikes me is uh, two things. First, when I look at what Inge says, I mean, the view the rest of the world is giving to, uh, I mean, to Europe. There is, I mean, we need to have a sense of urgency. The second thing is, when I look back, a lot of things have derailed since 2000. In 2000, uh, there was a vision, there was an agenda, the Lisbon agenda, there was a constitution mm -hmm. project, 
there were a number of things which were going in the right direction. Since 2000, we have seen many obstacles and many issues. I think we have to bring the train back on the rails. And for that, we probably need some clarification and reforms. And I think we should leverage the British request for clarification to come out with a better prioritization and some reforms. Mm. And I think, um, Felix, you also mentioned that sort of simplification and, and trying to get things more simple. And I think it, it, you know, there's just too much going on. And back to the prioritization thing, I mean, you can't run a successful business if you don't have clear priorities and manage what you're working on instead of broadening it out to really encompassing too much. So hopefully that'll come out of these, these discussions and we'll have a tighter, more concise agenda. To sum up, we should all try to make a problem into a solution. <laughs> That's, of course, the idea. Any other question? Less political, maybe. Uh, yes. <laughs> the microphone over there. Hello, I'm Callum Tanner, Insurance Risk Magazine in London. Um, Mr. Havard, you talked about the insurance industry losing its innocence. Um, I wondered if you could say whether the insurance industry should try and regain its innocence or whether what the response should be then from the industry. And also with the ICS, obviously some disagreements about whether it will actually happen or, and take effect. Um, isn't the biggest problem um, disagreement from within the US and how do you see US regulators um, becoming part of the, uh, being part of an agreement across the international scene? We're going to discuss the, la the last point at the panel this afternoon, but nevertheless, if Felix, would you like to comment? Once you've lost your innocence, there's no way back, as we all know. So that's, <laughs> that, that box is ticked. Um, uh, the, 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 the other question, um, I'd like to pick up a point Henri made, which unfortunately I have to agree with uh, entirely. Um, uh, for a very long time, um, very smart people on the, the accounting side have not been capable to create global standards on accounting rules, bridging US GAAP, IFRS, and other local GAAP systems. And that indeed is, there's no industry out there where that matters more than within the insurance industry, g given the long-term nature and the impact of differing accounting rules. This is not good or bad, this is just a reality. So if you're a financial regulator, you probably have to reconcile two things. On the one hand, um, a certain level of modesty that you should not pretend. You can implicitly resolve all those accounting issues as sort of a minor part of your financial regulation endeavors. On, on the one hand, on the other hand, you just can't stop doing what you're doing. So you have to find creative ways to get around that. And the answer IAS has found, and I, I personally try to sort of create as something I would call sort of a convergence architecture, is a very patient process of creating an ever converging process towards what we call an ultimate goal, which we don't know when that's going to be achieved, but it's already a major achievement for a global standard setting body comprising everybody that you did agree on such an ultimate goal. But the combination of agreeing you have to converge prudently, and there's something out there where if AXA, for whatever reason, will decide to relocate from Paris to any other place in the world, they should essentially have the same capital requirements and resources, and uh, they have it being um, in the middle of Europe. Um, that, of course, is a very aspirational statement. We all know that. But that's, that's about the spirit of the ultimate goal I'm talking about. Okay. Um, we have a f maybe time for one more question, and then I think we have to conclude the panel. Is there one over there? A micro? Please. Thank you. Alexandru Cionkan from uh, Media Extreme Insurance Magazine in Romania. But as I'm also a member of the IRSG of IOPA Consumer Rep, I need to ask you, there were, there were a few things being discussed about consumers, about the future of European consumers during the, today's panel. And um, I would like to ki kindly ask you to tell us whether too little or too much is being done for the fate of the European consumer. I mean, we heard about over-regulating and so on and so forth. So maybe you can comment on that. Thank you. Felix, maybe that's a question for you directly. Uh, 
Well, I, I love that question for a very simple reason to start with. Um, it should remind us that if politicians start talking about accessing the vast pool of money embedded in the insurance industry for purposes of public infrastructure, um, I start getting nervous. Um, of course, that's a good thing. Of course, it's an obvious match, being a long-term investor, putting money into long-term projects. But, thanks to his question, we should remind ourselves, it's not your money. It's the money of millions of policyholders where you have a fiduciary obligation to invest prudently and safely over a very, very long period of time. And so I apologize for speaking as a regulator and reminder of ourselves, this is, not, this is not an anonymous pool of money you can just tap into from a macroeconomic point of view, and you're very happy to just find it right there. And then you just skip all regulatory requirements on that by lowering capital requirements or what have you, um, and, then, and, and you solve all your problems. That's not the case. So thank you for reminding all of us that it's the consumer's money invested in whatever it is. Um, second part of my answer is, um, yes, I am worried that after prudential regulation may gradually level out a little bit, that there may be a too high of an appetite to refer conduct-related rules and regulations on insurance as well. I would share some of the comments which have been made uh, uh, previously on the stage. Many of it, at the very center of it, is not unwise, but the danger of overdoing it, I think, is imminent. And I personally, this is a personal statement I'm making here, um, you know, whether or not, sorry for being slightly relaxed about all sorts of things, but whether it's point something more or less capital on something doesn't make the system unsafer. But overdoing a whole range of conduct regulations can kill whole business models. And I'm quite nervous about that. So again, it's a calibration game for the benefit of consumers, because eventually, if you overload an industry with conduct regulation, you dramatically reduce choice. And I would remind all of us, um, those who suffer most from it are usually middle to low income households. And that is not acceptable in my book. Yeah. Oh, you wanted to add something to that? I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, uh, Felix has just said. I mean, the, uh, uh, the consumer regulation is, of course, I mean, the second essential pillar of the temple of, uh, uh, of regulation. So solvency discussions have taken over since the financial crisis. But I see very well what, uh, what Felix is mentioning, and I am 100% aligned with him. I think we have in Europe some examples of some overdoing in terms of regulation. Uh, once more, I mean, at the risk of being blunt and upsetting some people, the UK is a very, very clear model for that. I mean, we, uh, the UK life industry has been largely, uh, quote, affected by the uh, over-regulation on uh, I mean, the relationship with the customer. And it's clear that today, I mean, if you look at the fact that banks have exited the, uh, the bank assurance market on the life side, that a very large fraction of the population is left uncovered because nobody under the current set of regulations wants to take the risk of, quote, giving advice. Uh, and I think the, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a model we should look at not to replicate it. Okay. Very wise words, ladies and gentlemen. I think by, on those words, we unfortunately will have to close the panel because uh, in the interest of time, uh, I th it's difficult to Just sum up what has been said. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of opportunities. There is a need to better understand what insurers can and cannot do because that also leads to questions of infrastructure investment, also leads to questions concerning consumer protection. But on those words, I think we've all deserved now a coffee break.